Okay, we're good to go. Let us know in the, let us know in the chat. We're, we're going to proceed. But again, when this video is posted on YouTube, there will be closed captioning um, available for students. So thank you so much for joining us. My name is Asada Gilmore, and I have the honor of serving as president of Purdue Student Government. And my name is Hannah Walter, and I have the honor of serving as the Purdue Student Government Vice President. Um, so to kick us off, if a few of our administrators that have joined us, if you could start with just a brief um, introduction of who you are and then what department you're representing. Hi, everybody. I'm Heidi Carl, Executive Director of Financial Aid. Nice to talk with you this evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Wong Davis. I'm the Vice Provost for Enrollment Management and really glad to be able to chat with you all this evening. Good evening, I'm Barb Frazee and I am the Assistant Vice Provost for Student Life and have responsibilities over housing and dining on campus. Happy to be here. Hi everybody, I'm Jenna Rickus. I am uh, the Interim Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. Hi, everybody. I'm Beth McCuskey, and I'm the Vice Provost for Student Life. Good evening. I'm Eric Barker. I'm Dean of the College of Pharmacy, serving on the medical advisory team, as well as now providing uh, overall leadership for the Protect Purdue Health Center. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. I'm Heather Servati Saib, and I'm the Interim Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. Greetings, everyone. My name is Chris Collins, and I am the Director for International Student Services at Purdue University, West Lafayette. Hi, I'm Mike Brzezinski, Dean of International Programs. That's everyone. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us, um, engaging with students in this way. Before we get started, just want to go over um, some of the rules for this evening wanna um, any and all questions are, are welcome. We collected some via the Qualtrics and so we'll go through those, but please feel free as questions come up to ask them through the chat. Um, this session is being recorded. And so if you don't feel comfortable having um, your camera up, if you wanna ask a question later, then um, that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, we will be ac accepting questions via the chat and until they come in, we'll be um, asking questions that previously came in through the Qualtrics. Okay, so to kick off our first question um, is about attendance. So many students have asked, will attendance be recorded? And if attendance um, is, they're worried about if attendance is gonna be recorded, if that will incentivize students who are sick to attend class. So um, maybe if Dr. Rickus, you could touch a little bit about attendance and then what classes will look like in the fall. Yeah, happily, this is a great question, an important one. So there will be a Protect Purdue syllabus statement um, this year in all your course syllabi. It'll be released soon to all of our fall instructors and it will include attendance um, guidance and syllabus statement. So our existing academic regulations on attendance call for reasonableness um, from both our instructors and students. And obviously it's critical that anyone with symptoms, anybody who's been instructed uh, to quarantine or to isolate should not be coming to class, whether that's a student, a TA, or an instructor. And so therefore, uh, the only reasonable course of action during uh, a pandemic is that grades not be directly tied to physical attendance. And so that's the, the basics of what that attendance uh, syllabus statement will be. Now your instructors may broadly um, talk about participation uh, as virtual, but not tying grades to uh, physical attendance. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Rickus. Um, and so for our next question, students have asked how the testing will work when they come back to campus, as well as the testing that's gonna happen before they come back to campus. So kind of what that process is gonna look like. So if um, Dean Barker, if you could touch a little bit on that. Sure, so I'm, I'm real excited to share some of the details. In fact, uh, depending on when you are returning to campus, if it's before uh, August 12th, 
you should have actually received a very specific email today around three o'clock with very specific instructions. And so it's important to think about uh, our uh, COVID-19 testing in sort of two phases. The first phase will be this return to campus phase. Uh, we, sometimes we call it the test all phase. And as people are coming back to campus, we are asking everyone to, to uh, complete a, a diagnostic test. Uh, we recognize the strengths and weaknesses of the current COVID-19 diagnostic testing. Uh, it is a point in time test, which means it captures just the, the moment where the test is done, but then it usually will take several days before the actual result is known. And so we understand that nuance, but we do know based on prevalent studies that there will be a certain percentage of our population that ha is already uh, uh, positive for COVID-19 most of whom will prob probably be asymptomatic, that is without symptoms, and may be infectious. And so the intent of the return to campus testing phase is to essentially remove the, the influx of disease from outside of Tippecanoe County and, and our local community to protect, that, protect us from that very first initial wave. And so that testing will happen uh, pri probably primarily for most people through a telehealth option and that was announced last week by the university you'll and you'll uh, those again who are coming back before august uh, 12 would have received their email today uh, the rest of the students will receive a, a very specific instruction on monday of next week with the details of how to engage that telehealth option through vault health it is a saliva based test so you may wonder a little bit about that for those who are familiar with the ancestry.com or uh, 23andme approach uh, they use a saliva uh, sampling kit it's actually the exact same sample kit that ancestry and uh, 23andme use so it's a it's a saliva collection and then you would uh, have a telehealth consult where the nurse will observe that collection and then you'll be able to send it back in from the comfort of your home own home. Now, we do recognize that there are some students who cannot complete a telehealth option. And so we will be announcing and also sharing some additional opportunities through other uh, local uh, pharmacies and other health systems if you need to use them that we can gather uh, that information uh, from those other alternative uh, testing approaches. So I think we've got uh, both the telehealth option and then some live options for that return to campus. And then ongoing, once we get into to, uh, to the semester, you may wonder about how that will occur. Those, those will be managed to protect Purdue Health Center and they'll be managed on protocols uh, that are uh, in uh, accordance with CDC guidelines. Currently, uh, the CDC guidance is that testing should be done for those who are displaying any symptoms consistent with COVID-19, and then anyone who is defined by contact tracing as a high-risk contact. And if you have questions about that, we can talk a little bit about what a high-risk contact is. Uh, and, and, and there will be some additional surveillance monitoring uh, for folks based on particularly employment and jobs on campus if they're uh, student-facing or um, public-facing roles that have a very close contact with others uh, for sustained periods of time, we'll, we'll wanna monitor that. And so it, the, the testing strategy uh, ongoing will, is based on a, an idea of mitigation, which is reducing the threat, testing quickly, and we have internal capability for doing those tests on campus. We'll be able to turn results in one or two days at the, the top side, but in some cases, we'll be able to do same day resulting and that allows us then uh, to help with isolation and quarantine as well as move quickly to identify close and high risk contacts to again allow those folks to quarantine so that we limit the spread of the disease. So I, I think I'll stop there and if others have questions about any of those things, I'm happy to answer more. As a follow up question, Dr. Barker, um, and this might also go to Director Frazee, but um, what does the process look like on campus if a student is to test positive? So again, uh, Protect Purdue Health Center is the hub for all of this. It's uh, access through 496 info, and, and there's a there's a, a toll free number as well on the Protect Purdue website. The Protect Purdue Health Center uh, will uh, look and be the first point of contact to determine if someone is symptomatic and determine if they need to be tested. Now, obviously, one of the challenges is that now the list of symptoms for COVID-19 is quite extensive. Uh, and they'll have to work with uh, PUSH and other he local healthcare providers to rule out other disease 
so, so uh, they'll be coordinating that, but they'll they'll handle the, the testing. And then once a student tests positive for a student in uh, residence halls, the Protect Purdue Health Center will work with that student very quickly uh, to move them to isolation space. Uh, there'll be academic support, uh, student life support uh, while uh, they are, are there as well to ensure, you know, issues related to, to food and, and mental health are addressed. Uh, and, and then the, the case managers at the Purdue, uh, at the Protect Purdue Health Center will work with the student uh, to, to ensure that when it's appropriate for them to come back to campus. Um, or, or to to, uh, to class. The current CDC guideline was changed last Friday, so we already had to amend our protocols a couple of times based on CDC guidance, but uh, the current guidance will be that once someone tests positive, it is no longer a retest strategy, it is a time-based strategy, and uh, it is a 10-day window uh, once you've tested positive before you can come back to campus. Um, for those who living are living off campus, they'll be given the option to isolate uh, in their own uh, off campus residences, but the, their access to campus will be governed under the same time based rule. Does that help us? Yes, All right. thank you. Um, so then for the next question, we've had a few students ask about what the changes in residence life might look like. So what's that look like specifically for dorms and then um, as well as dining courts? Is that I think is happening in the residence halls is that we have in some of our locations actually de-densified and have taken some of our smaller double rooms and um, change those into singles. We've also been able to de-densify in some of our quads and taking those down to triples and in some of our apartments and taking those from quads to triples as well. We're also, um, as you know, requiring face masks in all public and community spaces. Residents will need to wear a mask on their way to the bathroom and in every instance, unless they're showering, face washing, or toothbrushing. We're really fortunate that students are able to connect and build strong community. And so the floor becomes their home. And when they're in their individual rooms, we're not requiring that. We've also changed our guest policy in that the only guests that will be allowed into residences wings are students and each student is allowed one guest. And so the most that would be able to be in a double would be four people. Those are some of the bigger changes. In dining courts, we have a lot of changes that are happening. We have um, changed to a complete carry out program. We've um, had some good opportunities over the summer to test that. We've also um, changed the menus. We are working on having um, basically four different lines at each location of current dining courts. And students will pick their um, entree and then um, all of the locations will have the same sides and then students will be able to pick fresh fruit desserts and beverages before they leave we've also changed the entrances and exits so that there'll be one entrance and then you'll exit out of two different exits as you leave so that we have a more um, robust pattern of how students queue and the queuing will be done inside the dining court for each specific line we also have um, really ramped up our ability to help students who have um, dietary needs and restrictions. And we're going to have an allergen free station at each dining court. We also have our um, ability that every student can work with our registered dietitian by contacting allergic boiler at Purdue if they have dietary needs and restrictions. So we are working really hard to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of all of the students. And then the one other thing that has changed is that as Aramark is taking over our retail locations on campus, we're going to be adding a Jersey Mike's, a Chick-fil-A, a Qdoba, and a Panera, all which will have options for um, students to have the ability to use their meal swipes there as well as in the dining courts. Thank you, Director. Finley. And just as another clarifying point that we've had lots of students share about, I know you've been doing great work to make sure that um, the containers are just really useful for the students that the food will be coming out of it. So um, eco-friendly. So if you could talk just a little bit about what options are we considered there for the takeout containers. Sure. I'm happy to talk about that. I, 
I feel like we've gotten a little bit of bad press because there have been lots of people posting pictures of what we're currently doing. And we currently are using styrofoam containers that we had on hand that we are trying to use up our supply as we've had a little bit of delay with the sustainable containers that we've ordered. But on August 7th, we anticipate getting in a few semi loads of a, a sustainable container. And so all of the dining courts will switch over at that point. We're also getting containers that are better designed for the food that you might be getting in the line that you're in. And so there'll be a variety of different types of containers. The other thing that we're making sure of with those containers is that they are leak proof and that they seal and that they're all microwavable. We're trying to make it as simple as possible. If you want to come to the dining court just once, or if you want to go to work, we will have a couple of carryout locations where you can order ahead. And if you want to pick up three meals, you can do that. And so we're trying to make the containers friendly in the fact that you can put them in a backpack or in a bag and take them back and put them in your refrigerator and heat the food when you uh, like to eat it. So we don't want things leaking. And so we're working on that. And then everything that we're putting out will be um, sustainable and recyclable once we uh, switch over in August when the students, before the students return. And so uh, this is a few questions geared towards financial aid, um, care funding and work studies. Uh, we'll start with um, care funding. What is the care funding act and how do I qualify and how do I apply? And so um, if director Carl wanted to answer or um, Vice Provost, um, all right, I'll be happy to jump in here and, and uh, welcome Chris adding anything as well. So the CARES Act funding is the federal government's funding that was approved back in the spring semester to help college students with unexpected expenses. And so at Purdue, the way that we are administering those funds to students is through an application process. The application is available on our website and for spring semester, it was up for eight weeks and students could submit the application for expenses related to food, housing, technology, medical expenses, any type of expense that was unexpected due to the disruption of the spring semester and our switch to being online. We currently have the summer application available on our website. And so students that are uh, still experiencing unexpected expenses this summer can complete the application and it can be reviewed for funding. And we will stand up an application for fall as soon as the fall semester begins um, until that funding is exhausted that Purdue received. The money goes directly to the student through uh, the Bursar's office directly as a payment to them. So it's a little bit different than any other financial aid that students receive. It's not something that's applied to your bill, um, but it would be direct funding to the student. I'll just add a couple of clarifications, Heidi, because we know it. We're so intimately involved, but right. for students to know, the the funding came with a lot of really strict federal guidelines. And so the only students who are eligible for CARES Act funding are students who are eligible for Title IV funding. So what that means, if you are not eligible to submit a FAFSA, Mostly our international students fall into that category. They are not eligible for CARES Act funding. So that's an important sort of caveat. And that's not a choice we can make. That's a federal regulation. The other federal regulation that came with it is that we can't provide funding for loss of income. And I know we saw a lot of students who they lost their campus job. They lost an off campus job. Well, we understand that was a big impact. We had direct guidance from the federal government that these funds could not be used for loss of income. So if there's some confusion there, I just wanted to be able to share those two elements because these aren't decisions we made, they're decisions that we were working within. Absolutely, thanks Chris, good points. Uh, this is a follow-up question that came via uh, the chat. 
what are the financial aid options for international students? And, and this might be more appropriate to, rec to Director Collins or um, Dean Brzezinski, or maybe not, that could be totally wrong. So I'll jump in quickly, Heidi and Chris and um, Dean Brzezinski, please feel free to add in. There are no financial aid in the sense that domestic students get options for international students. We have a few very, very limited, very focused scholarships for international students. They're funded by alums and different organizations, so they're very specific but there aren't large pots of money that we can draw from for international students. Really. So that is something that we were hoping to use funding for, but unfortunately that came through with restrictions on it. Well, oh, Chris is absolutely right. The federal government limits their funding to US citizens and US permanent residents. So it's, it's a federal regulation that Purdue cannot control. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and so then as a continuing question, a little bit about student orgs from some feedback we've got in the chat. Um, how will student orgs operate? What changes will be made? Um, some people are even wondering if your student org is gonna be able to meet in person. Um, so I don't know if Dr. McCuskey, if you wanna talk a little bit about that. You bet, Hannah, thank you. Um, so um, before I dive into the specifics, I think we, one of the things we're trying to work on is the overall philosophy, and that is um, obviously everything we're doing is to uh, maintain safety as best we possibly can. And to do so, um, trying to limit contact and cross contact as much as we can too, right? So over the um, summer, there have been several key policy documents that have been put together by the institution that will set the tone for how we're going to manage in student um, organizations. So the big one that, that just came out about 10 days ago or so is our event policy. Um, and so that one is, um, is looking to um, really all student organization events will be, um, per, I guess, permitted or approved through our office. So that's one of the key things, which is pretty typical to, to now. Um, all, all institutional events will be capped to 50 people unless there's special permission that, that basically goes through the provost office and as I understand will probably be pretty rare. Um, the, um, the events themselves will have parameters around them that um, will, will include all the hygiene things, social distancing, wearing masks. Um, there's a host of different, um, different things we're looking to put in place. How we are translating the event policy, which is out on the web, and you can all see, to the actual how this looks for student organization is being managed through um, the SAO office. And so uh, Dr. Bonner King's putting all that together, and she has some drafts that um, still have to go through the approval processes. So all of our, everything we're doing goes through um, what's considered our medical aid team. Um, and so everything that's happened in dining, for example, uh, co-rec changes that are, um, you may have seen, we're, we're launching the opening of co-rec here pretty soon. All of those things have been reviewed by medical staff. Um, the, the processes that, um, that have been proposed so far have not been reviewed by the medical staff yet. So as soon as we get those approvals done, we will um, plug them in. But in, in the meantime, I'd advise students to take a peek at the um, at the event policies. There's also a, a travel policy that really is um, very restrictive for all of us, right? Because they want to try to, we want to all stay close in community, not travel and, and bring back the disease, obviously. Um, with, all with the, um, the overall understanding that we're going to help protect each other by, um, by trying to, um, you know, not, not bring outside in and stay close within. So, um, so stay tuned on the exact outcomes, but the overarching guidelines are out there. So our next question is for Dr. Samaritai. Um, in regards to student training and learning about these new guidelines and practices that we will all be expected to, to, um, to learn in order to contribute to our community, could you touch on the training and then what um, measures are in place to enforce that, that, that students take the, these courses? Sure. So we uh, we developed a training for the students who were on campus this summer, and 100% of those students completed the training, which was great. Uh, and the compliance and the unfolding of that has been quite positive. 
We are in the process and Hannah and Asada are quite engaged in that process. They were in the summer and they are now, which we truly appreciate. We have a number of other students who are involved uh, in making the training as uh, compelling and, and important and uh, you know, engaging as possible. So the the training will talk really a lot about why to engage in the behaviors, a lot of information in terms of the, the critical nature of, of COVID and how critical these behaviors are in terms of preventing the spread. It will include very specifics about the behaviors themselves uh, and uh, information uh, from alums in terms of their interaction. We just got a video this morning from an alum who's a nurse that works in Indianapolis in, in emergency rooms talking about her experience. Um, it's it's uh, very powerful, actually. And the, the training uh, will be required of all students. The email will go out on August 3rd. And then on August 10th, students who have not yet completed the training will receive another email indicating to them that their access to My Purdue will be limited until they they complete the training. Students will also be required to uh, update their telephone number and their address uh, so that the contact tracing process can work as smoothly and effectively as possible. Uh, and on a weekly basis, they'll continue to receive emails up until classes begin. Uh, and then uh, into the semester, if students are not responsive, which they're going to get a number of reminder emails from Brightspace, there's going to be a lot of messaging about the training, uh, then there will be ramifications connected to students' registration for their courses beginning September 7th. So that's a big consequence, but there's a long time period with lots of reminders, uh, lots of specifics before that time period would would come. Thank you for um, sharing a little bit about the training. And I know you mentioned contact tracing and then some students may not be as familiar with what that is. So Dean Barker, I don't know if maybe you want to touch a little bit about what the contact tracing process is and kind of how that will work for students. Sure. So within the Protect Purdue Health Center, we have a number of trained contact tracers and contact tracers are individuals who are skilled in a, a type of interview that helps to identify the individuals that you may have been in close contact with. And the, the current medical definition of a high risk contact is someone who you spent more than 15 minutes with in an unmasked situation with no facial covering uh, within six feet. Uh, and, and so it's the 15 minute within six feet with no mask is the criteria that is generally used. Now that's the quantitative definition. There's also a quality to what you're doing with someone as well. And so that's where contact tracers have to have a conversation to find out who you were with, who you were around, what were you doing? How long were you around them? And so they will interview anyone who turns positive to identify that close, uh, close uh, high risk contact list and then work with those high risk contacts to ensure that they also can get testing and are in quarantine. This, the, the Protect Purdue Health Center will also be working in partnership with the Indiana State Department of Health. And after we have completed our initial uh, uh, pass of the Purdue community circle of high risk contacts will be working with the state to assist in any additional contact tracing that might need to be done. And, it, and this is really, really important because we can identify positive cases, but suppressing spread of the disease is completely dependent on our ability to do very rapid contact tracing and get those who are in have been in high risk contact situations uh, out of circulation uh, in quarantine until we can get them tested. And so, Dr. Barker, um, a popular question for this evening um, is, is there an exact number of how many outbreaks or cases will um, be, need to arise or is uh, a number to where campus will shut down for the semester? Yeah, many people want to know the, 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 the question, and it's a very reasonable question to ask, Asada. And, and um, it, the reality is it's, it's complicated, and there isn't going to be a single number that dictates those sorts of uh, those sorts of decisions. We will be hopefully creating, our intent is to create a, a very public and transparent dashboard that will allow everyone to see a, a number of metrics 
uh, and we will define uh, along those metrics uh, where we are in terms of our what we would consider maybe a threat level to our campus. Things like the number of students in quarantine, number of students in isolation. Uh, a very important number to watch that we watch even within the states is is called percent positivity. It's so in, in a daily number of tests that are administered, what percentage of tests are turning positive? Uh, and, and usually you're looking at a three day moving average of that positivity uh, percent positivity number. Most places would say you want to be under 5%. The state, uh, uh, many states are now moving closer to 10%. Indiana as a whole is at about 9%. And, uh, but I can tell you, Tippecanoe County is hovering about 5%. And so, again, our, our numbers have, and within the county have been, have been pretty low. So, it's going to be a, a combination of metrics. Looking at severity of cases, we'll be tracking severity of symptoms within patients. Uh, you know, are people sick? Are they asymptomatic? So it's a complicated uh, series of, of numbers that we'll be tracking. Again, publishing them publicly, uh, hopefully on a daily basis. Our intent is to update them daily. And again, uh, measuring the threat level to our campus. And if you can think about it, maybe it's gonna be sort of the green, yellow, orange, and red, right? Where green is we are all in the clear and red is we probably need to shut down. Obviously, we know we're not in the clear coming out of the gate. So I'm sure we'll, we would start sort of in a yellow range but then we'll, we'll we'll set those thresholds of where we begin to get more concerned, just like the states have done as they've looked at many of their own metrics. And I want to add one other thing that people may not be aware of. Today, Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb announced a mask mandate for the state of Indiana, effective on Monday. Uh, and so the, the question about whether or not uh, you'll be able to be in public uh, without a mask, at least in the state of Indiana, seems to be going away as of Monday, and we're very, very pleased that our governor has taken this step to protect Hoosiers, and I think this is gonna go a long way to help us protect Purdue. Okay, and so this next question is directed towards um, Dean Brzezinski and Dr. Collins. If you can talk a little bit about what changes have happened to BGRI, BGR International, um, and kind of what that quarantine process looks like for people who are um, traveling internationally. So I can talk about the BGR, BGRI orientation changes simply from a perspective of being an outsider who's very interested in what is happening. Um, there will be a fully online version of BGR, BGRI available for students who are either participating from a fully online enrollment or who are here on campus and who are in self quarantine at the time the events are happening. Um, BGRI has been fully incorporated into BGR this year. So there's no prepended program for international students. They'll be conducted uh, synchronously with BGR. Um, with regard to quarantine, any individual faculty, staff, or student who's coming from outside the United States, entering the United States from another country must self quarantine for 14 days as per the CDC guidelines and the protect Purdue health center will help manage that process. I don't have anything additional to add. Good job, Chris. Maybe add a couple things just about BGR in general and um, some of the things we're learning actually from our early and summer start students that are here right now. I think there's um, students are learning a lot about how to be socially connected at while physically distant. And so I think there's a lot of student experimentation and in, in how to do this and recreate the events that are meaningful to students. Um, they're having nightly events right now, the students that are on campus, and um, we're getting a lot of reports of students re being really happy to be here, to be connected um, and within the Protect Purdue framework. So um, I know the student leaders working with BGR are, um, you know, really trying to reinvent to, to capture and maintain what is so uh, valuable and meaningful to so many students, but in a new way. Thank you all for answering that. 
Our next question will be for Director Carl. Uh, it's in regards to work study. And so how will work study work? Um, and if I am a student taking classes online, am I eligible for work study if I'm still in the area? Sure, great question. So federal work study is a need based program. So first students have to file the FAFSA and we see if they're eligible for federal work study. And if they are, then they're able to get a job on campus. But this year, because uh, we do have limited funds in work study as well, online students can still get a job on campus, but they won't receive the federal work study. Um, students that are taking courses on campus would still be packaged with federal work study. And there are many, many jobs on campus that are available both to students who have federal work study or who are paid through our student payroll. Um, so there still would be jobs available for them. So jumping back to academics a little bit, um, Dr. Rickus, if you could speak a little bit to what classes might look like and kind of the different options. A few students have expressed concerns about the synchronous online option, needing to, for example, maybe take a Zoom call, that's for an early morning class, but not having a good space to go to take that with some of the limitations on spaces. So maybe if you could just talk a little bit about how the different class options um, will work. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the course schedule came together around July 15th, and this was, and we've since been working on your student schedules. So looking at all the courses, there's, um, as we sort of planned, you can look at them and see there's a wide range from face-to-face, -face, what we call high flex. Um, I can talk about that a little bit more. Hybrid, which means that there's a blend of um, online and face-to-face -face components in a course. And you may have, you've taught in hybrid formats even before COVID, but um, as well as online. And we've really, for the residential um, students, so we're sort of separating the residential from the fully online students. The residential, um, we actually have um, faculty that have really studied the student experience, particularly um, for the sort of college age uh, student and the synchronous, um, online gives an opportunity to really be um, connected in a virtual world and together in that space. So there's an emphasis on synchronous for the um, online experience for the um, any components in for students who are on campus. Um, and the nice thing about uh, those digital when you're on campus is that you're connected through our more robust uh, infrastructure, Wi-Fi, et cetera. It's a great question about um, participation in online com or synchronous components of your course, whether it's hybrid or a synchronous online class. And we have definitely been looking at the Wi-Fi around campus and enhancing it in places where maybe weren't traditionally necessary um, for students and in out what does it look like in outdoor spaces, et cetera. And also adding um, a sort of new study. You may, you may need to find your new study haunts or have opportunities to find new places to study this year. And part of that comes from um, the, the way we've scheduled courses is a little different. So we may have brought some new rooms online or released some rooms into study spaces, but because we um, aren't going, we're really limiting visitors and li limiting external events, that actually opens up some new spaces for you, for students, really prioritizing academics and studying. So I think, um, and our Dean of Libraries is um, leading a, a student study assessment space. And, and now that the course schedule is done, they're really gonna be um, getting more into the fine details of that. So we're really working hard to have new and good um, hangout places for you to study and um, eat and other places and do things like that. So. Um, you'll have some new opportunities to find some new spots to study this year. If I could jump in too, um, we, we are, um, and we know we have some weather challenges, but we are hoping to take advantage of our beautiful outdoors through at least a big chunk of the fall with some outdoor opportunities. And so you will see tents all over the place. Um, we have them set up currently in, um, in the dining areas. We will have study tents scattered throughout campus, and we will be freeing up some space that might have been, as, as Dr. Rickus mentioned, uh, space that might have been used in the past for more conference kinds of events. 
to turn into study space. And then I did see a question about student orgs. Student orgs will still be able to reserve space. Um, we just have to get uh, the, the schedule done, the, the course scheduling done, and then we'll be looking at, okay, how's the best way to, um, to manage the student org demand for space in the evening? So absolutely still planning to have that opportunity for student groups, um, just kind of uh, working within the queue to, to make that happen. Um, I, I should say too, we want students to have amazing experiences. We know that these experiences are gonna be a little different than what you might have experienced in the past or even what your hopes of college might, might be like, right? But it's it's kind of a different environment, and we're all having to to deal with it and band together to to make the most of it. And so we're trying to make some quirky, fun things too out of this, right? So can we do something fun at the beginning of the semester and have a socially d distant choreographed dance, right? Where people join in and we have somebody choreograph the dance steps for them, and we fly drones over and video it. I mean, just something quirky, cool, and fun. I mean, these are the kinds of things we're looking for. You know, I'm 54 years old, so I probably have really nerdy ideas. So uh, we want you to kind of help us figure out what this needs to look like. Um, so so really, um, you know, we, we want to make this amazing for you. Um, just recognize that we do have some of these limitations we have to, to manage just to, to keep this disease at bay. And then kind of as a follow up on the academic side, um, how will exams work this fall? And then also for students taking the online option, will they still be able to receive their accommodations through the DRC for online classes and exams? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think you are going to see a lot more um, uh, online exams and assessments. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, you know, almost half of our evening exams last fall were over 150 students. And so we do have 150 person as the absolute maximum we can have in a classroom um, space, even socially distanced. So, and that also having a lot of your assessments, quizzes and exams and such online also opens up um, just like we talked about for attendance um, exams. We don't want to, um, incentivize students to attend an exam um, if they're developing symptoms, et cetera, and also to make it accessible and fair for students who are in quarantine or in isolation. Um, but I think your experience is gonna be a lot better than it was, I, I kind of refer to spring as emergency remote instruction. It was sudden and unplanned. Your instructors um, have been working intensely to redesign and reimagine their courses for fall. And we have done that in a systematic way um, and supported that from the university. We have over um, now 750 instructors and courses who have gone through an intense um, course intentional redesign. And one of the things that um, is part of that, that developing their own contingency plans and what we call um, Resilient pedagogy, what that means is basically how do you preserve the key interactions between students and students and instructors, the communication and the learning, um, even as disruptions and sort of perturbations happen. So a student needs to step away and be in quarantine. An instructor may need to step away and be in quarantine. And so they're making plans um, for how they coordinate with each other, who's the other instructor that's their pre-planned backup. Um, we also have technology to allow if an instructor, say, is asymptomatic but needs to quarantine um, and, uh, and can continue engaging with an in-person class but remotely. We have, this is one of the, the powers of the high flex model that we talked about. And high flex really means that individuals, whether it be students or instructors, can come in and out of the physical space while maintaining that um, those connections and participation. So, for example, one of our um, professors who's really innovating in this space right now in uh, early in summer start has been sending me screenshots in his class. He has had 34 students in the classroom. He had seven that were remote um, to it, but participating synchronously. Two of those were outside of the country. And he had one instructor who was in the room and one instructor 
who is participating remotely. <laughs> so that's a great example of a high flex um, sort of environment. So you're going to see a lot of that. Oh, and the DRC. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, uh, accessibility and accommodation is um, as we move more things, just content, even online, that is very critical. You absolutely your um, testing accommodations and all your accommodations will continue. Um, in an online and remote environment, absolutely. The DRC has new COVID specific information up on their website. Um, and also that's another outcome of all this work we've done with courses. Accessibility of all the digital materials has been um, a primary uh, objective and goal of all that work that's been happening with your courses as well. This is a general question um, and who, whoever's qualified to answer. In regards to if a, a student gets sick and is quarantined on campus, are there plans to enforce um, the quarantine period and enforce the 10 day no return to campus policy? I can address it from the classroom perspective. We, um, we are planning to, um, to monitor and issue uh, attendance letters, which is both a benefit for the student um, so that um, if a, a student consents, that attendance letter can be issued to their um, instructors, much like we do now um, from ODOS um, for other excused attendance things. And, um, and that also will inform your instructor of who shouldn't be in class. And also um, we're working on a mechanism to then when a student is then released from quarantine, notifying that they're, they can return to class as well. So I don't know if others want to address um, maybe some of the other components of campus. Yeah, I, I can make a, a comment to uh, Jenna. So it's important to note that the information that comes from the Office of Dean of Students does not identify that the student is in quarantine or isolation because of COVID. It's a generic, the student has been excused for medical reasons uh, for a certain date. It's the same letter in essence that we already send if, if a student calls in uh, and needs a medical excuse uh, and, and likewise uh, the release. And so there is no uh, identifying piece that, that links to COVID um, specifically. Again, there's any number of reasons medically why students need excuses. Um, the, the question is really one that's very difficult, right? It's been one very difficult for us to wrestle in society uh, of how we enforce isolation and quarantines. And there's been several a very uh, public cases of individuals who in, in acts of defiance have refused uh, isolation and quarantine. It is one of the challenges. I, presumably most of you are 18 or older, you are adults uh, and we have, we, and just like you could leave a hospital against medical advice, um, you, you uh, may want to uh, leave isolation and quarantine. And of course, we're hoping that we don't get into situations where folks refuse to do that. Um, and, and, and if we did, obviously we would step up, you know, we have a responsibility to the protect, we have a responsibility to protect the Purdue community. And I need to make it, uh, you know, very clear that students coming onto campus are agreeing to the terms of the protect Purdue pledge. And part of that is to abide by the, the guidance from the protect Purdue health center, especially as it relates to testing and contact tracing and the aspects of it. And so I would say that if you uh, are not abiding by our isolation and quarantine rules, then you're not abiding by the pledge. And as student, uh, the Office of Dean of Students can, can be involved. Absolutely, I was gonna jump in on that, Dean Barker. The, um, so the Dean of Students Office has been working this summer too. Um, we really have language that, that covers this particular situation because it's, it's essentially following the university's rules. The trustees have approved this. this is, the way we're going to roll this year. And so we all have to agree that we'll follow these protocols. And it's not just the students, it's all of us, right? To be part of Purdue, we all have to agree to follow the rules. So um, so the, the conduct office at Justa Fancic and, and um, OSSR will be point in handling any kind of situations where people aren't following those rules. That's everything from violating, you know, they, they, they're not listening and not isolating when they're supposed to, or you know, just not wearing masks in public repeatedly, that sort of thing. So uh, we don't want to that, obviously. We want folks to agree to, you know, really take one for their own health and the health of the community, follow the public health guidelines. 
that are, that are given to them. Thank you um, so much for sharing. And so our next question, I think, is going to be um, for Vice Provost Wong Davis. Um, how many students are respect, expected to return to campus this fall? Um, and then what's that kind of breakdown look like between students who have chose on the online option versus the number of students who might be coming back to campus this fall? Sure. Um, I will say that any number I have for today are likely to change between now and the first day of class. Muted. No, I'm not. Can you hear me? I think I've got some connection issues. Better? Okay. So I will say that whatever I share today in the way of numbers is likely to change and will continue to change until we hit um, the second week of classes when we generally do our census. And But as far as we stand right now, based on what we see, we're expecting roughly about 30,000 undergraduates to join us on campus this fall. So our top, typical population would be a total of a little over 34,000 total undergraduate students. And that leaves us with what we were thinking we would have. And that's roughly about 4,000 students who've taken the option to be in the fully online option. So some of that I said may change. There are students who have extenuating circumstances that may need to move between the options. We don't have a whole lot of flexibility to accommodate changes, but we will try as we can. That said, we think we are still in the ballpark of 30,000 undergraduates on campus, 4,000 undergraduates fully online, I don't have final graduate numbers yet for total enrollment for campus. That's still a little bit in the works. This next question is to follow up to um, recyclable containers. And so will students be encouraged to return the containers? There's a concern um, that without properly washing them, they won't actually make it into the recycling. And does dining and catering have any intentions of, of doing some educational um, materials on campus while students are at the dining halls, for example? Asada, that's a really good point, and we absolutely are going to be doing probably lots of education about that. Uh, we'll be providing education on how to keep your containers so that they're able to be recycled. We'll be doing education in the tents. We'll be doing it in the residence halls. We also will have separate containers, um, as in recycled containers and trash containers in all of our tents. And we're actually putting out quite a few more containers all across campus because we know that students will be taking their food with them to various locations. One of the things that we're also hoping that students do is that we're going to be providing um, antibacterial wipes in all of our locations. And so um, one of the things that we'll be encouraging students to do is when they finish eating to put their food scraps in one container uh, and then put their containers in the recyclable container after they've uh, wiped them out. They won't actually be containers that we're washing on location. We've tried that in previous years and had pretty abysmal luck with students actually remembering to bring them their container back. And one of the things that is a factor for us is that um, while it may seem like we're doing dining quite a bit different, the people who were working in the back of the house and were in our dish crew are now having to um, kind of shift their hats, if you will, and they're uh, going to be working on the serving lines because we'll be filling the drink containers, we'll be packaging the desserts, and so their jobs have shifted quite a bit, and we won't really be running our dish rooms at the same rate that we were able to do so when we were an all-you-care-to-eat facility. But great question, thank you. And I wanna say one other thing, we are working with students on campus right now. Um, we've been um, working with some of the sustainability groups that have students who are on campus now. And so I appreciate that student voice and know that dining has been working with them and meeting with them. And in fact, some of them were even invited over when we were picking out our containers so that they had a voice in the type of containers that we were actually purchasing. Um, to be used for this process. And Director Frazee, while we've got you, could you touch on the move-in move process that students will be going through in the next few weeks? Sure, it's gonna be really different for um, those who are moving into university residences. It's pretty much a touchless process. 
um, and all students, not just BGR, will be um, getting their room key and getting um, their information in a remote location. We have three different locations. We have um, the South Campus lot. We have um, a location up by the stadium, and, and then we have one other um, discovery lot where we'll be checking students in. Um, everyone in the car is checked to make sure that they have a mask. We also are checking the temperatures of all the occupants of the car to make sure that no one is at a 100.4 or a higher temperature. And then only the student and two helpers are allowed into the um, residence halls for move-in time. And um, that's a two hour limit for those three people who will be doing the move-in. And so that's a lot um, more restrictions. We're also not allowing um, roommates to move in at the same time. And again, that's to allow social distancing within the room. Some of those rooms would not really be a good location for six people to try to be moving around and be socially distanced. So we're changing that up. And I also know that um, fraternity, sorority, and cooperative life is working on the same kind of a model. They're trying to have um, a limited move in time, and they're also trying to have some signups. So all over campus, we're hoping that um, we'll be able to keep social distancing happening. We've also extended the move in time for BGR. It's now five days instead of two. And then anytime over those 10 days that we open early for BGR, we'll have um, signups available for students who are returning to live with us who are upperclassmen. Thank you, Director Frazee. Um, and so a few students have asked like about the wellness kits. So what's included in the wellness kits? And we know that not all the details, all the details might not be worked out yet, but um, how are students going to get the wellness kit? Thanks, Dr. Rickus has one to show. She was wearing one of the masks yesterday. I, well, I have it right here. I've been wearing it all day. The masks are super cool. They're my favorite, actually. There's two. So here's one, and then the other one has a really cool black with Purdue logo. Um, the kits look like this. They come in a pack with the Purdue, and they've got um, wipes, and they've got um, this cool uh, hand sanitizer and things like that. You will also, and a couple of, a thermometer is in here, and some non-aspirin tablets, um, which I haven't had a fever, but... Um, I do have Zoom headaches, so <laughs> maybe I'll use it for that. Um, you will also be issued um, a face shield. So we talked a little bit um, in some of your, you know, in some of your courses, are there active places, your instructional apps, et cetera. So in courses where you may be moving around or be in um, closer proximity, you'll have this, you'll have your own face shield to wear on top of um, your mask. It's clear um, and fairly comfortable and such. And so this will allow you, um, and, and Dr. Dean Barker may want to say a little bit more about the science of the face shields in addition to the face mask, but this will be additional um, PPE or personal protective equipment that will issue you that you can use in active classrooms and instructional labs. On distribution, and if we can just we'll have one final good. question before we close. A few students have asked about um, the quarantining and as well as the testing process. If they are coming from out of state or from a hot spot, um, a hot spot for the virus in general, or if they're flying, if they need to get tested again when they um, return to campus. Yeah. So again, it's a point in time test. At this point, uh, it appears that. Well, a good chunk of the of the United States is considered a hot spot. So, um, it, so uh, you know, and again, three weeks ago, we were actually not planning on testing everyone anyway. Uh, and when we began to go down this road, the CDC said it issued guidance that universities were not to test all on return. Indiana State Health Department asked, actually asked us not to test everybody on return, but we just saw what was coming and felt that this test all was the approach. Again, uh, point time test, uh, once you get here, there's not a, 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 a case of retesting. Um, we're trying to, again, to eliminate that influx of known people in the, in, in, that have the disease at, at a point in time. So uh, after, after the initial test, we do ask everyone, once you take your test, our, our, 
our plea, our, our ask of you as Purdue students is that once you've taken that test, you need to start following the aspects of the Protect Purdue Pledge. Uh, and I've, I've told folks, you know, really, here's the reality. Keeping our campus safe is really not that difficult. If you are sick and show symptoms, call the Protect Purdue Health Center, stay away from campus and get tested. Other than that, keep your distance from folks, wear a face mask and wash your hands. And if we do those four things, we're gonna make it through the fall. Well, thank you all so much. We wanna be as respectful as possible of, of your time. Um, and we know that Zoom fatigue is real important. So we're very appreciative to our administrators um, and staff and faculty for joining us this evening. We know you've had a long day. So thank you and to students, thank you for tuning in after your busy day as well. And um, feel free to follow up at studentgovernment at purdue.edu if you have any more questions that you haven't been able to get answered tonight and we'll be sure to connect you um, to the right, the right people to make sure we get those answered and we're looking forward to having you back online or virtually this fall. Um, and again, big thanks to our administrators who joined us to help out with this town hall tonight. We'll make the recording and closed captioning available on our YouTube page probably by the end of the week. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Mortarboard, Old Masters, Grand Prix, Pisa, is there any? Oh, I'm not muted. Oh my gosh. Hey guys. <laughs> I'm going to check <laughs> up and everyone left. <laughs> what did you think? Let me stop recording. Or, yeah, can I stop recording? Okay.